Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very interesting one on the Gospel of Mark. Now, we usually think of Mark as a short gospel we read through fairly quickly and lots of interesting stuff there. Let's see if we can find out what's sort of unique and special about the Gospel of Mark. We're coming down toward the end of our series. This is lesson number nine for August 31 of 2024, entitled Jerusalem Controversies. Hmm. Controversies in Jerusalem? Well, we of course are gonna need some good insights into looking, learning about the controversies in Jerusalem, so let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we depend on you for life and health and everything that we have. We know that you faced these controversies. You struggled through this, all this difficulty for us. And now help us to understand the issues that were going on here and how we can more clearly and correctly follow you as our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. As you as a good Christian Bible reader already know, if you're a student of the Gospels particularly, whenever Jesus went to Jerusalem, he was almost certain to enter into controversy with the religious leaders. In our third lesson discussing Mark 2 and 3, we discussed five controversies between Jesus and the religious leaders in the early days of his ministry. Now in this ninth lesson, we will discuss six controversies between Jesus and the same religious leaders in his last days in the temple before his crucifixion. In the book of Mark, these two sets of controversies provide bookends for his ministry. So let's see if we can figure, out that, figure that out and learn what, what it means, Jim. The religious leaders came, excuse me, come to confront, confound, and defeat Jesus, but they never succeed. Part of this lesson, part of this lesson will include analyzing just what it is that brings people into opposition to God and considering what Christians can do to break through prejudice and speak to the hearts of those resisting the Spirit's call. In Mark 11, Jesus' ministry will be in Jerusalem for Passover, March to April. Mark chapters 11 to 16 cover little more than one week. The narrative, excuse me, the narrative time has slowed down markedly. The first 10 chapters cover approximately three and a half years. This slowdown points to the importance of these closing scenes from the Bible study guide. And of course we know that these closing scenes which is the, is the Passover week and the week before Passover um, that saw, you know, led up to the crucifixion of Jesus. As we saw in our last lesson, the people who escorted Jesus up from Jericho to Jerusalem were sure that they were taking him to Jerusalem to be crowned king. The disciples had decidedly mixed feelings because they wanted Jesus to be king. However, they realized that the religious leaders in Jerusalem were very opposed to the ministry of Jesus. Jesus, knowing full well what was going to happen, wanted as many people as possible to be aware of the events leading up to his crucifixion. Um, and we're not gonna read Mark 11, one through 10, but that tells us about the triumphal entry. All these people come up to Jerusalem, many, many people coming up there for the Passover. And then in preparation, uh, they, on that Sunday morning, Jesus did what? Well, we'll read about what's gonna happen now. This describes Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It was a Jewish tradition that a new king would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. That was the way Solomon was announced as king following David in 1 Kings 1, 32 to 48, and was the way prophesied in Zechariah 9, verse, chapter 9, verses 9 and 11, that the Messiah would arrive. So what's Jesus doing? Jennifer? Is he intentionally fulfilling prophecy? Well, do you think he should have? Was he consciously fulfilling prophecy? Or did it just happen like that? Yeah. Well, Jennifer? From Ellen G. White. 
500 years before the birth of Christ, the prophet, the prophet Zechariah thus foretold the coming of the king to Israel. This prophecy is now to be fulfilled. He who has so long refused royal honors now comes to Jerusalem as the promised heir to David's throne from the Desire of Ages. And you wonder if there were any scribes, uh, I mean, Sadducees or Pharisees in that crowd trying to declare him king. Were there any spies, any instigators that were there? Well, sure, of course. Mm -hmm. Ancient Jerusalem is not a large city. It covers only about 250 acres, which is about a half a mile by half a mile in size. The Temple Mount itself covers about 37 acres. So, Gordon? The Bible study guide. On Sunday, Jesus entered from the east, descended the Mount of Olives, and likely entered through the Golden Gate onto the Temple Mount. That's a gate that's now bricked shut. This, the entire city was stirred by his entry. Everyone recognized the importance of his symbolic action. The crowd that accompanied Jesus shouted, Hosanna, a term originally meaning save now, but eventually coming to mean praise to God. <clears throat> the time for secrecy, which Jesus had insisted throughout most of Mark has passed. Now Jesus openly enters Jerusalem using a well-known royal symbolic action. He enters the temple, but because it is late in the day, he simply looks around and then retires with the 12 disciples to Bethany. And why did he go to Bethany? <coughs> the home of La Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Exactly. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. What could have turned into a riot or revolt instead ends with him quietly retiring. But the next day will be different. For sure. The idea of riding on the donkey invokes the idea of humility. Why is that such an important trait, especially for Christians? What have we, in light of the cross, to be proud about? From the Bible Study Guide for Sunday. Well, we, there's one thing we can be proud about. What is it? Jesus. Jesus. God. Exactly. After entering Jerusalem with his disciples and many people who were who thought that he would be king, we read Mark 11, 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went into the temple, and looked around at everything. But since it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with his 12 disciples. American Bible. Okay. So now we're into the next day, Monday. Jesus went back to the temple and drove out the merchants. Okay, what we got going here? Mark 11, 15 to 18. When they arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus went to the temple and began to drive out all those who were buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the roots of, I'm sorry, the stools of those who sold pigeons. And he would not let anyone carry anything through the temple courtyards. He then taught the people, quote, it is written in the scriptures that God said, quote, my temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations, but you have turned it into a hideout for thieves. A hideout for thieves. How could he call it something like that? <laughs> the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard of this, so they began looking for some way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So now, they've been looking to kill him for quite some time now. A lot, quite a... Increasing their desire. Almost three years they've been hoping for a chance to hide, to arrest him and kill him. So why did Jesus clear the temple of all the common commotion and commerce in the courtyard? Where was that me? Yes. What happens next likely occurs in the court of the Gentiles where selling of sacrifices took place, recently begun by Caiaphas, by the way. Jesus clears away the sellers from the court so that quiet worship may return. His action is a direct affront to those in charge of the temple system, from our Bible study guide for Monday. So he's telling the, the people in charge of the temple, you're not doing what you're supposed to. This is supposed exactly. to be a place of worship and coming to God, and you've made it commerce, a, All a marketplace. All of these people in Jerusalem for Passover, I mean. Yes, 
Yeah. What an opportunity to make Lots money. of money. Well, remember, this is called the court of the Gentiles. Mm. So Gentiles were allowed to come into that court, and they were supposed to be coming there to learn about how the Jewish system worked. Mm. And what were they doing? Learning Exchanging money. money and selling cattle and sheep and goats and so forth. In order to understand more clearly the implications of this cleansing of the temple, we must look back to the early days of Jesus' ministry when he cleansed the temple the first time. Jim? The dealers in the temple demanded exorbitant prices for the animals sold, and they shared their profits with priests and rulers who thus enriched themselves at the expense of the people. The worshipers had been taught to believe that if they do not offer sacrifice, sacrifice, the blessing of God would not rest on their children or their lands. Thus a high price for the animals could be secured. For after coming to, excuse me, after coming so far, the people would not return to their homes without performing the act of devotion for which they had come. That sounds like uh, they're operating a little uh, deception, doesn't it there? Scaring people. And if you read Ellen White's writings and, and look at the whole picture, you discovered that the price of a sheep out just outside the gate was, well, was increased about 25 times as soon as you passed through the, and of course, one of the other things that happened was these lambs that were sacrificed had to be perfect. No scars, no blemishes, whatever. So they found lambs with just minor problems and then they would sell them to people, and then they would come up to the place, and the priest would say, oh, but there's a problem here. We have to get, this lamb's not good enough. You have to get another one. You have to get one at the 25 times price here. Yeah. And, then they and then they would recycle them. And that that's, it's story is told in a book by, by Joachim Jeremiah called Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You get all kinds of sorts of, it's a pair, paperback, but it's, it's very, very instructive. Mm -hmm. But it's not a whole lot different than Congress or any, anything in, in, our, in our society. Abuses abounded. Now you've gone to meddling. Well, but the Jewish leaders did listen. nothing to wreck them. From Ellen G. White, the, the priests and rulers were called to be the representatives of God to the nation. They should have corrected the abuses of the temple court. They should have given to the people an example of integrity and compassion. Instead of studying their own profit, they should have considered the situation and needs of the worshipers and should have been ready to assist those who were not able to buy the required sacrifices. But this they did not do. Avarice had hardened their hearts from the desire yeah. of ages. Well, Gordon, you want Another to take up section of the Desire of Ages, page 157. As Jesus came into the temple, he took in the whole scene. He saw the unfair transactions. He saw the distress of the poor who thought that without the shedding of blood there would be no forgiveness for their sins. He saw the outer court of his temple converted into a place of unholy traffic. The sacred enclosure had become one vast exchange from wow. Desire of Ages. And again, this is going back to the first Temple cleansing. The first cleansing. Ellen right. White's description, but it's same situation again, apparently. So Jesus took decisive action at the first cleansing of the temple. What did he do, Myra? Well, from Desire of Ages, again, it says, slowly descending the steps and raising the scourge of cords gathered up on entering the enclosure, he bids the bargaining company, he bids the bargaining company depart from the precincts of the temple. With a zeal and severity that he never before manifested, he overthrows the tables of the money changers. The, coins fall, the coin falls ringing sharply on the marble pavement. None presume to question his authority. None dare stop to gather up their ill-gotten gain. Jesus does not smite them with a whip of cords, but in his hands, that simple scourge seems terrible as a flaming sword. Officers of the temple, speculating priests, brokers, and cattle traders with their sheep and oxen rush from the place 
with one thought of escaping from the condemnation of his presence. <laughs> wow. Yeah. A panic sweeps through the multitude who feel the overshadowing, overshadowing of his divinity. Why they could see that it was more than just a man coming in and overthrowing tables. Cries of terror escape from hundreds of blanched lips. Even the, even the disciples trembled. Mm -hmm. So why did the priests flee from the temple? What happened? What, what did they see in Jesus that made them all run? Divinity. Divinity, yes. What would that the look like? God. They, it, it reflected their sins. Their guilt. Presumably. Why did not they stand their ground? He who commanded them to go was a carpenter's son, a poor Galilean without earthly rank or power. Why did they not resist him? Why did they leave the gain so ill-acquired and flee at the command of one whose outward appearance was so humble? Christ spoke with the authority of a king, and in his appearance and in the tones of his voice, there was that which they had no power to resist. At the word of command, they realized, as they had never realized before, their true position as hypocrites and, ro and robbers. Ellen White, later on in her book, Great Controversy, says, when God comes down the third time, this is at the third coming, and the wicked are all raised to life again. He's going to look out over the whole crowd there, and as soon as he looks at people, they're going to immediately be aware of every sin they've ever, quote, that's what it says, be aware of every sin they've ever committed. Well, here's a, here's a foretaste of that. Ellen White then says, um, the courts of the temple at Jerusalem filled with the tumult of unholy traffic represented all too truly the temple of the heart, defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy, unholy thoughts. In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly treasures, the selfish lusts, the evil habits that corrupt the soul. Okay. Jim, you want to take that next Ellen White quote there? Jesus had shown them a sign in flashing light into the, their hearts and in doing before them the works which the Messiah was to do. He had given convincing evidence of his character. Now when they asked for a sign, he answered them by a parable, showing that he read their mind, their, their malice, malice and, saw, me, and saw to what lengths it would lead them. Destroy this temple, he said, and in three days I will raise it up. In these words, his meaning was twofold. He referred not only to the destruction of the Jewish temple and worship, but to his own death, the destruction of the temple of his body. His, thus, excuse me, this the Jews were already plotting as the priests and rulers returned to the temple and they proposed to kill Jesus and, that, and thus rid themselves of the troubler. Yet, when he set before them their purpose, they did not understand him. They took his words as applying only to the temple at Jerusalem and with indignation explained, Forty and six years we this temple in building and wilt thou rear it up in three days. Now they felt that Jesus had justified their unbelief and they were confirmed in their rejection of him. Ellen White, Desire of wow. Ages, page 164. So we're still talking about the first cleansing of the temple, back at the beginning of his ministry. Already at the time of Jesus' first cleansing of the temple in A.D. 28, the priests vowed never to let him again interrupt their commerce in the temple. They were plotting to kill him. Seeing the commerce and commotion of the temple again, Jesus felt that something needed to be done. Now we're coming back to our end of his ministry. He chose to cleanse the temple once again. He had cleansed the temple earlier in his ministry, and this would be the second time. Now, notice the story about the second cleansing of the temple in Jesus' last week. Mm. This is from the Desire of Ages. 
Again, the piercing look of Jesus swept over the desecrated court of the temple. All eyes were turned toward him, priest and ruler, Pharisee and Gentile, looked with astonishment and awe upon him who stood before them with the majesty of heaven's king. Divinity flashed through humanity, investing Christ with a dignity and glory he had never manifested before. Those standing nearest him drew as far away as the crowd would permit. <laughs> Except for a few of his disciples, the Savior stood alone. Every sound was hushed. The deep silence seemed unbearable. Christ spoke with a power that swayed the people like a mighty tempest. It is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. His voice sounded like a trumpet through the temple. The displeasure of his countenance seemed like consuming fire. With authority, he commanded, quote, take these things hence from John 2, 16. Okay. Notice this very important passage, the next section. Go ahead. Three years before, the rulers of the temple had been ashamed of their flight before the command of Jesus. They had since wondered at their own fears and their unquestioning obedience to a single humble man. They had felt that it was impossible for their undignified surrender to be repeated. <laughs> they yeah. were never going to let it happen again. Can't let that happen to us again. And yet. <laughs> yet. They were now more terrified than before and in greater haste to obey his command. There were none who dared question his authority. Priests and traders fled from his presence, driving their cattle before them. Wow, Sarvages, page 590, 591. I mean, to, to see that flash of divinity come through and to move back and him speaking with such authority, it just... And, and it talks about the silence. I mean, think of all the animals yeah. that were there. Yeah. I mean, were the animals silent too? Well, I mean, just scuffling their f four feet on the ground <laughs> would make a lot of noise. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. The Jewish religious leaders were experts in the law. They had memorized large portions of it. That's the law would be their Old Testament. Often when Jesus ap approached them, he approached them quoting scripture. In this case, he quoted Isaiah 56, verse 7, as noted in Mark 11, 17, and referred to Jeremiah 7, 11. So, I mean, this is, these are words they, they had memorized, okay? Isaiah 56, verse 7, I will bring you to Zion, my sacred hill, give you joy in my house of prayer, and accept the sacrifice you offer on my altar. My temple will be called a house of prayer for the people of all nations. And then Jeremiah 7, 11, do you think that my temple is a hiding place for robbers? I have seen what you are doing. So there's no surprise in what Jesus said to them, but there shouldn't have been. As we've noted earlier, every time Jesus went to the temple and caused problems there, the chief priests and the teachers of the law looked for some way to kill him. Now, I guess they didn't really say that right. It wasn't Jesus who was causing the problems there. <laughs> they were the ones who were causing the Their problems guilt there. Was... He was trying to, trying to solve those problems. Well, then we have Mark 11, 18. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard of this, so they began looking for some way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So... And again, they'd been trying to kill him for three years already. Yep. And how did they want to do that? And it's important to recognize they were hoping to seize him in a quiet place, take care of him and get rid of him before, without people really knowing about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jesus was going to make sure that that didn't happen. Get him uh, in a quiet alley, huh? Yeah. On that Monday evening, we see these final events after the merchants fled. Now notice the change that took place. The Jim? melon white and the desire of ages. Mm -hmm. On the way from the temple, they, that is those who were fleeing from the temple, were met by a throng who came with their sick, inquiring for the great healer. The report given by the fleeing people caused some of these to turn back. 
they feared to meet one so powerful whose very look had driven the priests and rulers from his presence. Okay, I'm going to interrupt again. I'm sorry. <laughs> what did they say to those people who were trying to get to Jesus? What did they say about the look, in, the, you know, the look of Jesus? Mm -hmm. How do you think they would describe it? I mean, they're, they're trying to say, you don't want to go in there. You know, just one look from this guy. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. Continuing, but a large number pressed through the hurrying crowd, eager to reach him who was their only hope. When the multitude fled from the temple, many had remained behind. There were now, they were now joined by the newcomers. Again, the temple court was filled by the sick and the dying. And once more, Jesus ministered to them. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 592. So imagine what a change. No money changers, no animals, no dealers in there. And Jesus is healing and taking care of people, praying about them and so forth. Wow. Mm. Most of the conversations and discussions that occurred during this week were directly related to the status of the Jewish people in the eyes of God. We now go back in time a few hours to before the temple cleansing. So that was back into earlier in, in, on Monday. As Jesus and his disciples were approaching Jerusalem the morning after the triumphal entry and before the cleansing of the temple, Jesus saw a fig tree covered with leaves. It turned out to be an unproductive tree and Jesus cursed it. It should be noted that Jesus was not trying to steal fruit. First of all, we know that this particular type of, of fruit tree, the, the figs come out first, I mean, at least in small form, and then as the, as the fruit matures, the leaves appear. Mm -hmm. So that tree that had lots and lots of leaves on it should have had lots of good fruit. But there was something else we need to notice. It should be noted that Jesus was not trying to steal fruit. According to Jewish law, it was permissible for one to help himself to fruit or grain which was along the pathway as long as she or he did not carry any home. And that comes from a degree went all the way back from Moses. Myra? Deuteronomy 23, 25. When you walk along a path in someone else's cornfield, you may eat all the corn that you can pull off with your hands, but you must not cut any corn with a sickle. Okay. And there's other verses, Leviticus 19.9 and 23.22 that confirm those ideas. On the way out of the city, they saw, now this is Jesus and his disciples now, they're leaving probably in the dark now, uh, already dead. Uh, they saw the fig tree already dead all the way to its roots. Ellen White again, in the sentence pronounced on the fig tree, Christ demonstrates how hateful in his eyes is this vain pretense. He declares that the open sinner is less guilty than is he who professes to serve God, but who bears no fruit to his glory. Wow. Is the fig tree Israel that looks like it should be bearing lots of fruit and doesn't have any? That's what it sounds like, isn't it? Yeah. That's the parable. As we have noted in the past, the Sadducees believed they were the ones who controlled the temple and what happened in it. They were the priests. So when Jesus arrived back at the temple on Tuesday morning, they immediately challenged his right to be there and to preach because we are the ones who are in control here and we are the ones that will have the authority to give you permission to preach here and to meet here and so forth. Okay. Until Jesus opened his mouth. <laughs> until, Je until Jesus opened his mouth, right. Um, Mark 11, 27 to 33. They arrived once again in Jerusalem. As Jesus was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him and asked him, What right have you to do these things? Who gave you this right? And I, I think if I had been one of them, I would be a, a little reluctant to approach Jesus after what had happened the day yeah. before. But anyway, Jesus answered them, I will answer you 
I will ask you just one question, and if you give me an answer, I will tell you what right I have to do these things. Tell me, where did John's right to baptize come from? Was it from God or from human beings? They immediately knew they were in big trouble. <laughs> oh, you, you feel sorry for them, but you, you have to laugh even. They started to argue among themselves. What shall we say? If we answer from God, they will say, well, why then didn't you not believe John? But if we say from human beings, they were afraid of the people because everyone was convinced that John had been a prophet. So the answer to Jesus was, we don't know. Jesus said to them, well, neither will I tell you then, by what right I do these things. <laughs> <laughs> Turnabout's fair play. Jesus often illustrated his most important points by using a parable. Parables are somewhat of a challenge. A person hears the story, but she or he needs to draw his or her own conclusions. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a moment to read this. The parable of the tenant in the vineyard, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Jesus spoke to them in a parable. Once there was a man who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a hole for the wine press, built a watchtower. Then he let out the vineyard to tenants and left home on a journey. And of course, we know what happened. When the time came to gather the grapes, he sent a slave to the tenants to receive from them his share of the harvest. The tenant seized the slave, beat him, and sent him back without a thing, and so forth. And finally, of course, as you know, he sent his son and they killed him. Another parable about, the, about Israel, huh? Yeah. Okay. Mark 12, verse 12, the Jewish leaders tried to arrest Jesus because they knew that he had told this parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Bible study guide, Jim. In this story, Jesus is giving the rel religious leaders a solemn warning as to where their steps are heading. Seen in this light, his, his parable is a loving forward forewarning. It is not too late for them to change and avoid certain judgment. Some will repent, change, and accept Jesus. Others will not, from the Bible study guide. Okay, Jesus told the parable of the vineyard. Did that parable represent God's interaction with Israel as he nurtured Israel? From the Bible study guide, in the parable of the vineyard from Mark 12, verses 1 through 11, Jesus unmasks with precision the nefarious plots of the religious leaders to take his life in the near future. Christ confirms their perfidy in the parable with these words. They took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. From Mark 12, verse 8 from the American Standard Bible. However, given our discussion about the temple, what is most significant are Jesus' words in verse 9. In this verse, Jesus explains what will happen according to God's salvific plan. He will come and put the vine growers to death and give the vineyard to others. From Mark 12, 9. With Jesus' death, the entire tabernacle system reached its end. All its emblems pointed to Jesus. Additionally, the faithful remnant of Israel would carry on the mission. From this study. Wow. So... I mean, I've struggled. Well, you, we know that Jesus, Ellen White says very clearly that even at the age of 12, Jesus watched what was happening in the temple and he already had a pretty good idea how all those things pointed forward to his life and his ministry. Mm. And every time he came back to the temple, he must have recognized all those things um, many, many times. And would he, was he the only one who recognized those things? Well, William L. I have almost 12 year old grandchildren and I don't think they're quite up to that. You don't think so? No. <laughs> okay. Maybe close. <laughs> William L. Lane explained literal Israel's dire fate in the following words. From, as quoted in the Bible study guide, within the scope of the parable, the in inevitable consequence of the rejection of the Son was de decisive, catastrophic judgment. 
Without declaring his own transcendent sonship, Jesus clearly implies that the Sanhedrin has rejected God's final messenger <clears throat> and that disaster will ensue. The sacred trust of the chosen people will be transferred to the new Israel of God. From, okay. from Lane. Yeah. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were absolutely determined to catch Jesus in some kind of trap. So the Pharisees took their turn first. Now this is Jesus' last day in the temple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark so. 12, 13 to 17. Some Pharisees and the members of Herod's party were sent to Jesus to trap him with questions. They came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you tell the truth without worrying about what people think. You pay no attention to anyone's status, but teach the truth about God's will for people. Tell us, is it against our law to pay taxes to the Roman emperor? Should we pay them or not? Okay, I'm going to interrupt for a second here. Did they really believe what they just said there? We know that you tell the truth without worrying about what people think. You pay no attention to anyone's status, but teach the truth about God's people, God's will for people. We're buttering you up. We're, yeah, mm -hmm. and keeping the people <laughs> happy. Okay, go ahead. But Jesus saw through their trick and answered, Why are you trying to trap me? Bring a silver coin and let me see it. They brought him one and he asked, whose face and name are these? Mm -hmm. The emperors, they answered. So Jesus said, well, then pay the emperor what belongs to the emperor and pay God what belongs to God. And they were amazed at Jesus. <laughs> you know, you just, you almost feel sorry for them. Yeah. <laughs> Christ's reply was no evasion, but a candid answer to the question. Holding in his hand the Roman coin upon which were stamped the name and image of Caesar, he declared that since they were living under the protection of the Roman power, they should render to that power the support it claimed, so long as this did not conflict with the higher duty. But while peaceably subject to the laws of the land, they should at all times give their first allegiance to God. Desire of Ages 602, paragraph 4. Having routed the Pharisees, Jesus was then approached by the Sadducees with what was likely a hypothetical situation in which seven brothers ended up marrying the same woman. And how did that happen? Kept dying off. Well, kept you, killing the, the men, maybe. <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember what, uh, what the rules were that they were following? Leverite. leverite rule. The leverite rule. Leverite, what does it mean? A lot of people think the leverite means something has to do with the Levites. No, leverite is the Hebrew word for brother-in-law. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mark 12, 18 to 27. Then some Sadducees who saw that people will not, who will say, who say that people will not rise from death, came to Jesus and said, Teacher, Moses wrote this law for us. If a man dies and leaves a wife and no children, that man's brother must marry the widow so that they can have children who will be considered the, de the dead man's children. Once there were seven, seven brothers. The eldest got married and then and died without having children. Then the second one married the woman. He also died without having children. The same thing happened to the third brother and then to the rest. All seven brothers married the woman and died without having children. Last of all, the woman died. The woman died. Now, when all the dead rise to life on the day of resurrection, whose wife will she be? All seven of them had married her. So, in other words, the Sadducees are saying when all the dead rise, <clears throat> which we don't believe, of course, that they rise. Exactly. You know, they're making fun of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and they, they believed that this is an impossible situation. They were, they were making fun of what they believed was going to happen and what they didn't believe was going to happen in the future. Jesus answered them, how wrong you are, and do you know why? It is because you don't know the scriptures or God's power. Hold on. These are the people who had memorized the scripture. 
For when the dead rise to life, they will be like the angels in heaven and will not marry. Now, as for the dead being raised, haven't you ever read of the book of Moses? Haven't you ever read in the book of Moses? I mean, what kind of... The book of Moses that you memorized. Yes. The passage about the burning bush, there it is written that God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. You are completely wrong. Mm. I mean, mm. they probably wanted to grab him by the neck yeah. and kill him right, right on that spot. They were sure they had him. Yeah. According to Jewish law, if a man died without children, his brother was supposed to marry the widow, his widow and raise up children for the dead brother. And I can tell you in some places where I we used to work in Africa, they still follow that rule. And there's some, I mean, there, among Adventists, if a brother dies, then they expect the brother to not to raise up children for his brother, but at least to make sure that the wife is taken care of, which is reasonable. There's no social security system or anything like that out there. So uh, that's a reasonable thing. Uh, anyway, and that's Deuteronomy 25 that we looked at. As we have noted, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they tried to make fun of the idea of resurrection with the story of the seven husbands. Jim, Bible study guide. Yeah. Seeking to discredit the doctrine of the resurrection, the Sadducees point to a moral, di moral dilemma of whose wife the woman would be in the resurrection. Jesus counters their argument in two steps, referring to the scriptures and to the power of God. First, he describes the power of God in the resurrection and indicates that there will be, not be marriage in heaven. Then he defends the doctrine of the resurrection by appealing to Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 22, where God indi indicates that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus implies that this means that they will be raised. They cannot remain dead if God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who are now, for now, are dead. I wonder if they, I wonder if they followed his logic through all of that. I mean, what it, I mean, they knew that the, this passage is there. It's not, not just in, here in Moses' writings. He's referring to Moses because he knows that the Sadducees particularly focus on the Pentateuch, and they're not too sure about the rest of the stuff, but all the way through the Old Testament. I would say that the likelihood of anybody understanding was really slim because these people were pagans. They went through the whole 40 years in the wilderness as pagans. And they left, remember, uh, in, in uh, Book of Amos, and then also um, Stephen in his sermon yeah. requotes Amos. You know, you, you, you went into captivity, and, you're, and that, 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 they're still pagans to this day. Christians, are, most of them are pagans. Once again, Jesus completely routed their arguments by quoting from Scripture in Exodus 3, 1 through 22. And if you're, if you're supposed to be the experts on Scripture and someone proves you wrong in front of the crowd by quoting Scripture, I mean, how, do you, how do you respond to that? And the story of God calling Moses to lead Israel out of... So let's, let's just look at that passage. Um, Exodus chapter 3, verse 16, God says to Moses, Go and gather the leaders of Israel together and tell them that I, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appeared to you from the Good News Bible. Okay. And how did the children of Israel respond when Moses did that? Do you remember? For a short time, they followed him, didn't they? Well, no, I mean, I mean, right at the very beginning. Yeah. They didn't believe him. Well, Right there in Egypt, they didn't believe him. Since the Pharisees had been defeated and the Sadducees also had been defeated, they sought a teacher of the law to see if he could confound Jesus <laughs> and get him to say something. Okay. Mark 12, 28 to 34, a teacher of the law was there 
who heard the discussion. <clears throat> he saw that Jesus had given the Sadducees a good answer, so he came to him with a question. Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus replied, the most important one is this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Okay, this, I'm going to stop for a second. Where did those ideas come from? Deuteronomy 6. And Le Leviticus 19.18. And who gave, who gave those ideas to Moses? God. Assume Yahweh. <laughs> Jesus, yeah. Jesus himself had given those ideas to Moses, had been written down, what is that, 1,500 years earlier. So, Continuing okay. in verse 31, the second most important commandment is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is no other commandment more important than these two. The teacher of the law said to Moses, well done, teacher. Said not to Moses, said to said Jesus. Said to Jesus, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the, yeah. He said, well done, teacher. It is true, as you say, that only the Lord is God, and there is no one, there is no other God but he. Jesus noted how wise his answer was, and he, so he told him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now, I struggled with that when I was reading this lesson. Why... Why did Jesus say that? He was he, trying he, to get him to make that final step. He's the one that, he had I, I've knowledge. kept all these. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, all you have to do is sell all that you have. Okay, but now that, this is a different situation. This, this isn't that? This is not that situation, no. This is in the, in the temple court. In, in, in the last day, Jesus is in the temple. And so here's a scribe, and so that by definition, he's supposed to be an expert in the, in, in the law. And the teacher of law says to Jesus, so he comes with this question, which is the greatest commandment? And he gives the two choices. And then this teacher says, well done, teacher. So he's, he refers to Jesus as a teacher, rabbi. It is true, as you say, that only the Lord God, Lord is God, and that there is no other God but he. And it goes on a little bit, goes on. But Jesus noticed how wise his answer was. And so what was wise about his answer? Didn't he just say what? Well done, teacher. He just repeated what? Seems like he had just Jesus. repeated. Yeah. Well, he may have been insinuating you're close, but you don't understand the words you're saying. In Matthew 23, Jesus, seven times Jesus says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. Mm -hmm. Well, this teacher of the law was different from most of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Why? Well, the Bible study guide says, oh, on our anniversary. Um, up to this point, the Gospel of Mar Mark, most of the religious leaders, with a few exceptions, were agnostic to Jesus. Antagonistic. Antagonistic, and, uh, antagonistic to Jesus. At, um, this is particularly true in Jerusalem, where Jesus was confronted with the leadership over the temple worship, that which stands at the heart of Judaism. Thus, for a scribe to listen to the disputes and to anticipate Jesus's... Appreciate. Um, appreciate, not anticipate. Yes. Appreciate Jesus's response displays both honesty and courage in the face in face of the prevailing and, and animosity. animosity towards Jesus. Let me interrupt there again for a second. So here's somebody, the Pharisees are gathered around, the Sadducees are gathered around. They have tried to do everything they possibly can to trap Jesus. And this guy comes and he brings an honest question and Jesus gives a good answer. And Jesus says, that's fine, good job. And the guy, you know, the guy says, you know, You've done a good job, Jesus, with all of his buddies standing around watching him, and they're, they're, they're wanting to choke him and to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing. Go ahead. It, it would be easier to just stand back and watch, even if one were in sympathy with Jesus. But this man does not do that. Okay. Look at the passages in the Old Testament supporting Jesus' point 
in the discussion. And these are famous passages that we all know. Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Israel, remember this. The Lord, that would be Yahweh, and Yahweh alone is our God. Love Yahweh your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then Leviticus 19, 18. Do not take revenge on anyone or continue to hate him, but love your neighbor as you love yourself. I am Yahweh. Is it possible for God to command love? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is it possible for anybody to command love? Or is that impossible? Yeah. What God is talking about here was not some sentimental relationship, but rather true love as demonstrated in true loyalty. Do we show that in our lives? Today, many attacks against the Bible are coming from multiple directions. I see them every day in the newspaper and on the, on the internet, trying to suggest that the Bible has lost its relevance to our lives. This is the direct work of the devil. We must be so firmly grounded in the Bible that we would reject any such idea. And when we say that the devil, devil is a deceiver, what are, we, what are we really saying? He is going to mix, when we, we, we know it in his experience with, with Jesus himself, he's going to mix the truth with a little bit of air. And it's going to make it look like they're so just beside each other. And those days are right in front of us, friends, I can tell you. As we have noticed in Mark, almost the entire second half of the book is dedicated to the final week of Jesus' ministry on this earth. That is true of the other Gospels as well. Jesus had told his disciples on at least three occasions that he was going up to Jerusalem and what was going to happen there. They could not comprehend such a thing happening. They were sure that Jesus would become the Messiah and of their dreams. Jesus, of course, was fully aware of what was going to happen to, in Jerusalem. He tried to explain it to the disciples, but they had missed it. Two prior times are described in these uh, verses. Mark 8, um, where are we? Jim. That's Jim's. Mark 8 and Mark 9. Okay, Mark 8, 31. Then Jesus began to teach his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. He will be put to death, but three days later he will rise to life. Okay, then and again. Mark 9, verses 30 to 32. Jesus and his disciples left that place and went on, th on through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where he was because he was teaching his disciples. The Son of Man will be handed over to those who will kill him. Three days later, however, he will rise to life. But they did not understand what his teaching meant and they were afraid to ask him. Try to imagine what it was like for Jesus to be surrounded by multitudes of people wishing to be near him and to be healed by him while at the same time virtually no human being understood his mission. Even after his death and reported resurrection, they had already been, it, was, it had been reported that he, res he was raised. We read in Luke 24, 21, Jennifer. Jesus' followers on the walk to Emmaus said, and we had hoped that he would be the one who was going to set Israel free. Besides all that, this is now the third day since it happened. We had hoped. Try to imagine Jesus' emotions and thoughts as he went to and from the temple in Jerusalem, realizing what its purpose was to be and how much it had been corrupted. It was obviously supposed to be the center of religious ceremonies for the entire Israelite world. Pardon? From desire of ages, as they departed from God, the Jews in a greater degree, in a great degree, lost sight of the teaching of the ritual service. That service had been instituted by Christ himself. In every part, it was a symbol of him, and it had been fully, and it had been full of vitality and spiritual beauty. Let me interrupt there for just a second. I mean, every part of this thing is supposed to be saying something about Jesus. And there he is. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but the, the Continuing, but the Jews lost the spiritual life 
from their ceremonies and clung to the dead forms. So the ritual instead of the meaning. Mm -hmm. They trusted to the sacrifices and ordinances themselves instead of resting upon him to whom they pointed. In order to supply the place of that which they had lost, the priests and rabbis multiplied requirements of their own. And the more rigid they grew, the less of the love of God was manifested. Surprise, huh? They measured their holiness by the multitude of their ceremonies, while their hearts were filled with pride and hypocrisy. And hypocrisy. Our, okay, Desire of Ages, page 29. In our previous lessons, we learned that they had, they brought their own ideas in, and then they actually counted those ideas, their own ideas, more important than the scriptures themselves. Instead of listening to Jesus' messages, the religious leaders wanted the messenger to disappear. From the writings of Ellen White. The people whom God had called to be the pillar and the ground of the truth had become representatives of Satan. They were doing the work that he desired them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and to cause the world to look, up, look upon him as a tyrant. The very priests who ministered in the temple had lost sight of the significance of service they performed. They had ceased to look upon the symbol. Look beyond. Look beyond the symbol to the thing signified. In presenting the sacrificial offerings, they were as actors in a play. The ordinance of God, ordinances of God Himself were appointed, were ma appointed, were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through those channels. The whole system must be swept away. Desire of Ages. It is interesting to notice, I'm happy to say, that later, many of these religious leaders did accept Jesus. In Acts verses 6, verse 7, we read, And so the word of God continued to spread. And remember that we, at one point it was 3,000, and later they said 5,000 men, not counting women and children, had accepted them. Okay, the number of disciples in Jerusalem grew larger and larger, and a great number of priests, that would be the Sadducees, accepted the faith. And then in Acts 15, 5, some of the believers which belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, as we read these serious and, and, and really sad encounters between the religious leaders and Jesus, how can we, what can we learn and how can we make sure that we don't make those same mistakes? We thank you for the privilege we have of reading these things and realizing the mistakes that others have made so that we may not do them. May that be true about us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.